Hi, my name is Emily Dix and I am the Artistic Executive Director of Bygone Theatre. Welcome to the first of our Empower Your Tomorrow series. Today's topic is going to be an intro to financial and business literacy for the arts. So uh, just to give you a quick background on us, Bygone Theatre was founded in 2012. We produce shows that are written or set in the early to mid 20th century and uh, focus on stories that are uh, have a strong cinematic aesthetic. We do a lot of shows that were better known as films or start off as films and then have been made into theater. Uh, this season, we put on a production of The Birds and we've also got a production of Wayne and Schuster coming up. So in addition to our productions, we have a education series and thanks to IG Wealth Management, part of that is this Empower Your Tomorrow series. It's a, uh, a series of webinars that are um, uh, I should have written this down, a series of webinars that are uh, a help for artists um, trying to teach financial and business literacy um, in a way that's actually relevant to those of us that work in the arts. So I'm joined today by Connor Fitzgerald, who is the chair of Bygone Theatre, and by Adam Malcolm, who is an IG Wealth Management Consultant. And we're going to take you through some basic intro stuff. Um, there is a link on our website to where you can download a copy of the PDF and a handout if you want to follow along. You're welcome to ask questions at any time. There'll be a question period at the end as well. And this video is going to be posted to our YouTube channel afterwards for anyone who couldn't attend live. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Connor. Thanks, Emily. So um, I'm just going to go quickly through what we're going to be covering today. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about what money is, uh, just in really general terms. Um, then uh, we're going to have Adam take us through bank credit unions and other financial instruments. So those a little bit more of the nuts and bolts about how things work. Uh, Adam's also going intro, to intro us to budgeting and budgets. Uh, and then Emily and I, uh, Oh, and uh, introduce you to what different financial advisors and other professionals can do for you. And then um, Emily and I are going to take you through some specific challenges for artists. Now, when we, I'm just going to preface this by coming uh, at you by saying this webinar series, which is a thick webinars, uh, is designed to ensure that newcomers, um, uh, youth, seniors, and um, and specifically Indigenous folks who may not who might be marginalized from the financial um, uh, industry um, are welcomed into it, and we take that approach to everything that we do. So we really want this to be inclusive and uh, accessible, and uh, and take feedback for that uh, throughout. Um, Emily and I are both. Uh, Emily is an, an artist by trade. Um, <laughs> She has worked in the arts for 12 years now. I have a, a JD MBA and um, have worked with Bygone for seven years. And Adam actually has a background as an actor before he turned uh, financial consultant. So we come at this from all angles and are, uh, we're hoping that this is um, a, a nice intro to, to what finance and business uh, really means. So what is money? Um, it's sort of a, an interesting question um, because it can be a lot of different things. We think about money in a really uh, like as cold, hard cash, but we also have bank accounts. We also have, we start hearing about digital currencies. Um, but at the end of the day, money is a number of things. And, and most importantly, it's a tool for us to live. So. I'll walk you through what the different types of money are and then maybe talk about it more generally and how that applies to our life. So of course, currency is, as I said, cold hard cash. It's money you can hold. It's bills and coins, it's legally defined. So the government of Canada has said, we issue these bills, we issue these coins and everywhere in the country must accept that it is backed by the government, it is saying this always has the value that's printed on it. What that value means, we might get into, we'll get into a little bit later because that's affected by various things, both within our country and outside of it. But at the end of the day, 
if a $20 bill says $20, that is $20 in Canada, no matter what. An offset of currency is what's in your bank account. So we like to think about those as basically the same things where, um, you know, we deposit cash into our bank account and it, uh, a number goes up or we spend money and the, the number goes down. But in fact, all that is, is a, a, a ledger. So it's just saying how much money the bank knows you have. So there's no actual currency attached necessarily. I won't get too far into that, but the, the ledger balance on your bank account is not necessarily currency. It is simply something that the bank says, we know you have this much, so we're gonna honor that. We're gonna give it to you when you request it. Um, so in order to back that, the banks have insurance that's backed by a government agency. Um, and that's been in the news recently with some bank closures uh, in the US. Our banking system is slightly different. So it, we have um, different insurance backing, but we have the Bank of Canada, which isn't a bank that you can access, but it has money. It's basically a bank for banks. And then you have large banks, and then you have smaller banks, and Adam will get into that a little bit more, the difference between those banks and then what a credit union might be and what um, a, um, and then what as a part of those institutions you can get out of that. Um, and then we have digital currency. Um, so similarly to a bank account, this is a ledger. It is a representation of value that is on a piece of paper or in this case on a computer somewhere. Um, but those currencies aren't backed by insurance. They aren't backed by government uh, other than in very specific cases. But as a whole, those are just something that kind of exists and there's no guarantee to them. So they're very different than what we think of as money in that way because there's nothing behind it. There's nothing saying, we know this will always be worth something. Um, so in that way, it's much more similar to what you hear about in stocks and bonds and those sorts of things. There's, a, there's some people who will see the value, take the value, might pay you out in currency or through a bank account, the value of these things, but they're not the same as those things because no, nothing is backing them. Nothing is guaranteeing their value. And that's why they fluctuate so much. But that brings us into the other aspects of money because at the end of the day, like I said, money is a tool. It lets us live. It lets us uh, buy the things we need and the things we want. Um, and really it is a, a way for us to uh, just sort of easily trade with each other. Um, money has been around for thousands and thousands of years, but um, it's basically a representation of trade. So you could, you know, trade a, um, in the schoolyard, you traded Pokemon cards, and that is a trade of value. And that's not conceptually different than than trading money. It's just something that is backed that we always know value exists. Um, so again, that also brings us to what assets are. Um, so we use money, currency, we use our bank accounts, we use credit, we use various different ways, different things to buy things. Um, and those are generally considered assets. So anything that holds value is an asset. So money in itself is an asset, but also investments are assets. Insurance might be an asset. Your television could be an asset um, because you can trade it for other things of value. So when 
we think about money in this broader term, then it's you can see how the various things interact and what it means to have money in your bank account, what it means to have credit extended to you, um, which is again, a representation of money that the, the bank lets you use, but you have to pay back. So that's sort of the, the preamble to, to how we think about finance and business and uh, the tools that you'll, you're gonna need to, to engage in these sorts of conversations. So I'll turn it over. Oh, so I'll talk briefly about inflation, which we hear a lot about right now, because obviously inflation affects money quite a bit. And we're hearing over and over that we're in a period of inflation. And for most people, what that means is things are more expensive. Um, so that might make it feel like inflation is just this bad thing that we don't want that is just making it harder to live. But inflation is just something that naturally occurs because of the, the trade of money, the um, exchange of value through different systems. So generally what we see is that we want inflation to be about 2% just because naturally as we exchange things, value changes, the amount of total money that's being exchanged is constantly going up. So we expect inflation to be about 2%. When it's lower than that, what we say is that the economy is becoming smaller. So there's less, less money, relatively speaking, to go around for everyone. When it's increasing, there's more money, which means that the value of money relatively goes down. So that interplay between, as I said, the number value of money is always the same, always the number printed on your bill, always the number on your bank statement, that doesn't change. What that money can get you does, and that is, what inflation is. So right now we're in a period where because of um, a number of various issues, including the, the availability of goods, the availability of services, the, um, the, a period of time when we weren't spending money and exchanging money in the same way that being the pandemic, people staying home more, people spending money on different things that they didn't before. And then also importantly right now, a, a more unique aspect of that is that there's a lot of companies that have a lot of money that are holding more of it. So there's overall an increase in held profit for companies and that's also causing additional inflation. Again, more money available means that each dollar is worth a little bit less. And that's sort of what we see as inflation. I will let Adam, because he has, uh, in his, he might have a more practical uh, explanation of inflation. So if there's anything to add to that, I'll, I'll let you do that and then take over on the, um, on some of those practical yeah. pieces. I say, honestly, I mean, that's a, that's a great explanation of inflation right there. Uh, maybe just a couple notes. One of the things that people will often ask me is to say, okay, but, but why would inflation be something that's maybe not a good thing necessary, so to speak? And Connor already kind of pointed to this by saying, um, generally when it comes to the idea of an economy, so not, you know, me, Adam, Connor, you, um, you know, so-and-so down the street, our money, but all of our kind of working power together in this society that we're running. Um, kind of having that work, we want an expectation from a business standpoint that things will grow over time. Now, too much inflation is bad, as we've all seen in the last year, because if we you know, go to the grocery store one week and a bag of chips is $3, and then you know, a month later, suddenly it's $3.50 or $4, it becomes very difficult for me and you to accurately gauge what our grocery bill will be the next uh, month. So then sometimes we'll say, well, what about the opposite? Wouldn't it be better if, you know, kind of it went down over time? Believe it or not, that's called what's called disinflation, and it's not a good thing either. And think about it this way. 
if you're going to go to the grocery store and that bag of chips is going to be three dollars today or it's going to be 250 next month what are you going to do bag of chips maybe you need it right away but let's say maybe it's nothing maybe it's more of a computer maybe a computer is going to be a thousand dollars this month or all right maybe next month i can get it for 900. you're probably going to wait and the problem is if you wait and everybody waits and we all sit on our money then the grocery the grocers don't get paid the farmers don't get paid you know you probably don't get paid everything grinds to a halt so inflation can be a very complex topic and yes you run into things you know when you're talking about inflation in, a, in an economics sense it gets very textbooky when you talk about it in a real sense you do have to confront some things corporate greed corporate profits those are elements that really are real and especially in the last year we have seen so not to kind of harp too much on on this particular topic further but that's kind of an idea i think we need to understand that if you hold your money under your mattress it will not be worth the same amount today as it will be a year from now but especially five years ten years twenty years and a great example i use for this is when i was a kid i used to go to summer camp and my mom would give me a loony a dollar and i take it and i go to the vending machine and i would buy a bag of skittles if you've gone to a vending machine lately, that same bag of skills is, I think if you're lucky, $1.25, but more recently, probably more like $1.50. So, you know, 1996, it's a dollar. 2023, it's $1.50. That's inflation in a nutshell. Um, so Connor, if you can go to the next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about kind of banks, credit unions before we go on to the idea of financial uh, instruments. So. First thing to kind of keep in mind, you know, why do we use banks? Ultimately speaking, you know, we've decided as a society that it's better for us to kind of keep our money in a collective place. There's a few very real life uh, reasons for that. What happens if you're if you're robbed, right? If your house is broken into, all your money is uh, in a safe, they take that safe, suddenly all your life savings are gone. That is a real concern to somebody who is say living in Montana in 1850 or maybe they don't have, or, in, or people who are unbanked, for instance. What happens if there's a fire? Like things like that, you, can, you, you could lose that money. Because of what Connor said through the insurability of money in banks, through what they call the Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation. Sometimes see it as a little oval, it's purple, it's a CDIC with a little like a uh, combination lock with a maple leaf on it. If you see that on a bank, it means that they have insurance protection from the government up to $100,000 worth of your money. So even if the bank went out of business, as you know, rare as that is, I know we've seen a few of those in the States recently, but they are overwhelmingly rare, you would still have your money insured up to that amount. Now, what is the difference between a bank and a credit union? So a credit union, uh, effectively, you know, a bank started out in a way, and you can still do this, by the way, in the United States. Very hard to do it in Canada. But in the United States, if you have enough money, you can open a bank. Anybody can open a bank, it's very easy. And the States has tens of thousands of banks. Where in Canada, we have the big six, as we call them, Royal Bank of Canada, Bank of Nova Scotia, uh, CIBC, uh, TD, um, who am I missing? Bank of Montreal and National Bank. They make up the vast majority of banking and I would be willing to bet um, most of you guys watching this are banking with one of them statistically. Uh, and then everybody else is kind of the medium tier and then some, you know, you've got Tangerine, you've got EQ Bank, you've got, uh, you know, foreign banks that have places here like ICICI or HSBC, stuff like that. But the majority is those big cities. So they started out kind of quite a long time ago, effectively as people pooling their money. Credit unions are similar. And it was effectively, generally speaking, a group of folks, usually from either a similar uh, uh, community background, maybe they had the same kind of jobs, they were in a union together, kind of coming up with an idea of their own. And credit unions really came out, especially of the Great Depression, where a lot of banks had failed. And there was this idea of, okay, well, our money is better to be kept in our community. Banks are businesses. And they are kept, well, I mean, they, they are businesses. So their main goal is to, like all businesses, make money. How do they make money? A few things. As Connor mentioned, I go to the bank. I've got $100. I open a bank account. I put that $100 in the bank. What a teller does not do is take that money, put it in a safe, and it sits there 
you know, until either I withdraw it or like an Ocean's Eleven style big, you know, bank heist happens. That money will sit in the safe maybe for a day or two. Then it will be collected. It will kind of go around. So, you know, that, that actual bill might end up down the street at a different bank. It might end up in the ledger, or sorry, in the, in the um, uh, what do you call it, cash register of a, of a coffee shop or something like that. But it will be added to some kind of computerized ledger somewhere. From there, banks are required to give a certain amount of cash on those ledgers, ledgers but then they are allowed to basically invest or do or loan out or do business with the rest. And to be honest, you know, the original reason for having these kind of institutions is not to collect cash and have it to sit in a vault, but to facilitate lending. And actually, believe it or not, you know, when we look at the earliest forms of uh, exchanges of money, um, it is not barter and trade. It is not, I have a cow, you have 10 chickens, I will trade you my cow for your 10 chickens, you know, 10,000 years ago. They have found uh, historical and archaeological evidence to show uh, ledgers of credit in ancient Sumeria, like the first, you know, I think that's the Indus Valley, I don't know, I'm not a historian, but like the first human civilizations, as soon as we d developed the ability to, you know, basically make more than we needed, we started to lend to one another. And the idea here is it is trust. Because ultimately, I might not need 10 chickens. I might only need one chicken, but I can't cut, cut my cow in 10. That would kill my cow. So what I might instead say is, okay, you know what? You need a little bit of milk? Connor, I'm just going to give you some milk. And next time, I trust that you'll get me. You'll get me back. You'll give me some eggs. And eventually, that became an actual codified system of lending. So, you know, kind of, I'll, I'll let you guys flip to the next slide because I've already kind of started talking a little bit here about credit. Credit is how our entire world runs. And I think credit can be scary. And the way that I often describe it is credit is like having a cat on a leash. That cat can be a little kitty cat, like my guy Pepper, the little tuxedo cat. He's about yay big type thing. You wouldn't hurt a fly. Or it can be a Siberian tiger, and it could kill you in an instant. And a lot of times the difference between that comes down to what's called the interest rate. So you go to a bank or you go to a credit card company or whatever, and whoever it is, and you say, okay, I, I need you guys to advance me some form of credit. Maybe it's a mortgage, maybe it's a credit card, maybe it's a student loan that could be through the government. They will say, okay, you know what? We're willing to do that. Adam, we're going to give you $10,000 to kind of go back and, and go to school kind of thing. However, the deal is, to make it worthwhile for us, because we are, you know, a business, we're a bank in this case, we're trying to make money. You have to pay it back plus interest. And this interest is calculated as a certain percentage of the money that we gave you, and you're going to pay it back every month. So let's just say, all right, it's going to be 10% to make it easy. So every month I will pay back in periodic installments an amount of my original money that I borrowed, what's called the principal plus interest. And if you've ever taken out a mortgage or talked to a you know, mortgage professional or taken a look at what they call an amortization table, that's a, what they used to call a $5 word in there, but with inflation, it's probably more like a $15 word. It's a great little inflation joke for you. When you pay back a loan, the beginning of the loan will always be mostly interest and a little bit of principal. And as you pay it down over time, it will eventually switch. There will become a middle point where it's okay, equal amounts, 50-50. By the end of the loan, you're basically paying entirely principal, very little interest. This is also just as a side note, anybody who's ever you know, had to break a mortgage or prepay a mortgage where you have to pay penalties, this is where this comes from, is basically prepaying that interest on that side. So I say this to be very aware. You know, If, you, if I'm taking out this loan for $10,000 at 10% interest, and I'm going to pay it back over five years. By the time I pay it in full, I will have paid much more than 10000 I couldn't tell you exactly just mental math off the top of my head, but be aware of that. So interest can work against you in the form of credit. Now, the alternative is interest in forms of basically you do the opposite. So you say, okay, I've got 10000 
Maybe, uh, you know, I got a really, I, I won the lottery, got a nice little lottery ticket. Maybe my parents gave me, you know, a, a nice gift or something like that. I'm going to instead go to the bank and I'm going to say, hey, I'll give you guys this 10000 I know what you're going to do with it. You're going to lend it out to Connor down the way, whatever it might be. Um, but what do I get out of it? And the bank will say, okay, you know what? We'll hold that for you. It'll be safe. It'll be insured. And we'll give you some interest as well. So you're basically doing the opposite. So in terms of credit, I'm receiving that lump sum of money. I pay it back plus interest. In the terms of the opposite or debits, if you will, I will give them the money. They will pay me back with interest. This kind of then gets to the level of things like investments. So investments can involve interest, things like what they call GICs, which are guaranteed investment certificates. Um, effectively, it's the same kind of idea uh, I'm going to give you, Mr. Uh, Banker, $10,000, uh, and I will take it back in five years' time, but not before then, and you will give me probably better interest than I'm going to get in my savings account. That's generally the idea. doesn't matter if the market's up, the market's down, that's going to stay exactly as it is. It could be what's called a bond, which is a similar type of idea, but I could potentially take that bond and sell it to someone halfway through. Or it could be what people also uh, know as which are uh, stocks are one. So what is a stock? Back in the day, if anybody's got grandparents here, they might even still have some of these. I've, I've seen them in person. They used to print these on physical certificates, stock certificates, where you'd buy a portion of a business, right? What they call shares. So say me and Connor go into business. We start a company. Company does very well. And we want to raise some more money. We might say, you know what? We're going to take 100 shares and we're going to sell it to all you guys and we're going to say each one of those shares will sell it for $10. So you guys buy that, we get, you know, what would that be, $10,000, 1,000 shares, $10. And then if our company does well, you might go to your friend and say, hey, I've got these 10 shares. Do you want to buy them from me? This company's doing really well. They pay me, you know, as I get a little bit of money from them every, every month, every quarter. I'll sell them to you. But you know what? I want $12 for that. That is what stock price effectively is. It is effectively when you see a stock and you see, okay, why is it that one day it's here and then the next day it's here and the next day it's there? It is based on the value of the underlying business. There's a second portion to this, which is very important. There is arguably an amount that you can distill from how good a business is doing to make whatever that stock price is. There is a second part of whatever that number is, that is what is the other person willing to pay for it? And this is where we get into the idea of speculation. We're gonna have a whole webinar where we talk more about investments, so I won't get more into that, but just be aware that when you are buying an investment, think about what is the underlying value of what I'm buying versus what is the speculation of, okay, well, if I buy it for 12, I think I could probably convince this guy to buy it for 14 type thing. Another thing on the investment side, um, and I just want to check, do we have a, I don't think, no, we don't have, the next slide's on budget, so I'll just kind of wrap this up, is you can take multiple investments and group them together, what we call diversification. The idea of not keeping all your eggs in one basket. And that is where you get into what you may have heard, things like mutual funds, ETFs, stuff like that. These are effectively just groups of different investments that have been thrown together in one. And then the other thing, is, which is a big one that I, I should mention, is real property, right? So big example would be a house or a condo, right? Something like that. You buy it, you expect it to hopefully increase in value down the road, but it could even be something like a painting for instance, or uh, a rare guitar, right? When it comes to the idea of an asset or an investment, the important distinction between a, you know, expense or a good and an asset or an investment is it's something that you reasonably think will increase in value over time. So cars, the, you know, the big stereotype is the second you drive it off the lot, it loses half of its value. That may not be an asset if it's, say, your, sta your standard Toyota Corolla. If it is a rare Shelby Cobra from 1968, there's only so many in the world, and you could sell it at auction, then it might be considered an asset. So something to think about on that side. So effectively, when we come to financial instruments, the big ones there are the idea of credit, 
Remember, that can be dangerous, but it can also be a way to get big lump sums of money up front that you may need, say, to buy a house or to go to school, um, to fund uh, a business or even a show, if it's a kind of a business thing. We've got interest, which is the opposite. You've got more cash than you need. You want to find a way to safely make some money off of that. And then we've also got investments, which is the idea of taking money today and growing it exponentially for some point in the future. Um, so yeah, Connor, if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about budgeting. So the, the core, the, the seed, if you will, from which all wealth is grown is, I believe, the household budget. And just flip one more slide, Connor, please. The way I like to describe it is a budget is like a map. Budgeting can be scary as hell, especially when we're in a place where we know that we're living maybe paycheck to paycheck or potentially even spending more money than we're making, especially for you know us as artists. There are very f times that I remember. I used to sing a lot of choirs. You know, Messiah season in December, I would be flushed with cash. And then things would come along, you know, May, June. I wasn't really a wedding singer guy, so I didn't get as many gigs then. It'd be the opposite. So when I say a, a budget is like a map, a budget needs to be done from a place of no judgment and just to show you, okay, this is what's happening. And let me tell you, whether you make a budget or not, you need to spend money to live. You need to make money to live. However, you know, would you rather be driving a car to a destination where you don't know where you're going? Or would you rather have Google Maps help you out to get there type thing? And by the way, these lights are on a timer, so that's why they keep going down. Um, so yeah, when it comes to, to budgeting, Emily and Connor are going to take it over here in a second to start on how to, how to start it. Understand that a budget is very personal. It has to reflect who you are. And at the end of the day, I like to say that budgeting needs to be a verb, not a noun. You know, you can draw up the best spreadsheet in the world that says, okay, here's my income. Here's exactly how much is coming out for tax. You know, here's what I'm getting from the interest. Here's what I'm paying on my credit card. Here's, you know, exactly how much I spent in the grocery store down to the cent. And if you don't take that template and track your income and expenses in a way that you can determine first off, is that realistic? Or were you a little aspirational on that? Or were you potentially maybe even a little over to say, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of dollars, but really it ends up being less type thing. And you don't kind of keep that as a, a verb, budgeting. Then it's not going to be as powerful as if you have a, a clear idea month after month of, of where your money's going and what's important to you. I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thanks. Um... So when I think about budgeting, um, what I usually think about is uh, that there's two basic ways to start any budget. And this goes for household budgets or business budgets. If you're making a show, if you're, um, you're no matter what you need to spend money on, basically, anything you need to spend money on should have a budget. Um, and there's two ways to start that. So either you can find out what you have or you can find out what you need. So in terms of household budgets and, um, and budgets in which you, you can predict income, you can have, uh, you know, like maybe you have a chunk of cash, maybe you have uh, regular employment income um, or uh, those sorts of things, then you can take that money and divide it into sections and say, this is how much of that money I can spend on any one thing. Um, so you, generally we break that into a month uh, and see how much of the chunk of money you spend that month. You track how much you do spend and subtract that, to make sure that you're on track. And as Adam says, budgeting, so that if you are, if you can't actually spend that little, um, then you, increase the budget, take it from other places, 
or uh, if you are actually finding that you don't spend nearly as much as you thought, then you can take that money that you have extra and put it into other places. And that's, I think, that that verb budgeting where that really um, uh, comes into play. The other way is to find out what you need. And this is a bit more speculative. This is, and, and it may be in the arts that more oftentimes we're thinking about what we need and, and thinking that, you know, if we don't have that money available right now, there are certain things that are just, that you, you must know about. Um, so you figure out what things cost going forward, what things are required, and then you set targets to meet, whether or not that's finding uh, income from work, whether or not it's uh, getting extended credit, whether or not it's um, using your credit, your credit card points or other forms of uh, utilizing what, app, what things that you have at your disposal to reach those goals. So those are the, the foundational ways to, to start budgeting, um, which kind of bring us into where those, when you're actually creating the budget, where those expenses um, end up. So we look at it as basically four buckets. Um, and, uh, and I'll ask, I'm gonna go through this and I'm gonna ask Adam to give some of the advice that he gives his clients as well in, in this sort of a, a place. But basically when we look at these four buckets, it's like a waterfall where you have to fill the first bucket before you move on to the next one. So there are expenses that we have in our life that are non-discretionary. So those are expenses that are needs and obligations. So living expenses. What, what do you need to pay for rent on your lease? What do you need to pay in interest? What do you need to um, uh, pay uh, in food um, to, to keep living? Those sorts of things are non-discretionary. You always have to spend that money. So that's the first place you start with budget. The other thing is taxes. Of course, that's a legal obligation. If you live in, in Canada, you must pay taxes. But, um, so you have to ensure that you are setting aside money, if you're an independent contractor, for example, that you can pay the taxes that you have to pay. Sometimes it's, it's not an option. GST and HST is included when you buy stuff. Um, maybe you're a, an employee and it's just subtracted from your paycheck before you even see it. Sometimes it's not something we have to think about, but taxes are something that we always have to pay. Mm -hmm. Then we go down into um, what, uh, what Adam really specializes in, and that's about setting this sort of discretionary spending. Now, goals, the, the most important to th thing to think of is that goals are things that you choose, but you choose them in a non-discretionary way. So you say, how much do I need or how much do I have to spend on the things that I need to fulfill myself? Mm -hmm. So one way to think of that is paying yourself. So whether that's classes, if you're an actor, whether it's you know, something that really brings you joy is getting a new piece of clothing every month. Whether, whatever, whatever's really important to you to live your life in a way that feels fulfilling, that can be a goal. We traditionally have thought about this as long-term goals. A lot of people have a goal of owning a house or owning a car or having a, a wedding or these sorts of very long-term thinking that are large chunks of money. Those are fantastic goals to have and things that you should certainly work into your budget and think about how you can build savings accounts and, and um, nest eggs and all of those sorts of things. But it's also important to note that goals can be anything, anything that makes you feel um, fulfilled. And once you've designated money to that and you've actually filled up those uh, buckets, that's when you have extra money left over. That's when you can do things like get your get a coffee out every day and um, just, you know, things that just happen day to day 
that are truly non-discretionary, that you're not thinking about how do I make this happen every, every day? And who knows, maybe it is a goal for you, but for another person, it's discretionary. It's just these living costs that aren't needed to, uh, to, to leave, leave your fulfilling life, but are uh, nonetheless things that you encounter day to day. And Adam, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I have to say, you know, from a practical perspective, when you're setting up your actual budget, whether you're using like an app to help you, and by the way, you know, it's 2023, there are a lot of apps out there that can kind of help with this and make this an easier, you don't have to just sit in front of a ledger like you used to, but some people like to use Excel and like to use those spreadsheets. The way that I have found that's been useful for me and also been useful for other folks that I've coached through this is to quite literally put the categories in order of what's most, you know, basically what we said here. So at the very, very top would probably be rent, right? It'd be then hydro, like kind of those things that you need to just survive, groceries, et cetera, all the way down. Then the goals of paying yourself first. I also, you know, wanted to say, and like Connor alluded to, these goals are not for someone like us, you know, or myself to determine. They are entirely individual and to you. So one person's goal may be, okay, I want to prepare for retirement or something like that. Another person's goal might be, I want to go to Mexico next uh, next year. So I'm going to save towards that. Another person's goal, like I said, might be, okay, acting classes. To me, they're not discretionary expenses. There's something that is very important. Uh, so my own personal example, it's singing lessons. I am no longer a professional singer, but it's still something that's important to me in here. So I still make a point that I personally would, if push comes to shove and I got to make a decision, rather do my singing lessons bi-weekly than go out to a restaurant, so to speak, if I have to make the choice. Because from a practical perspective, there will also be times where there are months, like we mentioned, that each of these categories may not be able to be filled up. I do think it's an important thing as an artist to have one of your goals to be some sort of slush fund so that in the months where we cannot fill these up just by income coming in the door, we can draw that income from call it an emergency fund, call it a slush fund, a certain amount of cash that's sitting already there. Um, but ultimately, if there is a, a, you know, a month or a period of time where it just it does not, you know, the math does not math, it is not, you know, a personal failure on you. There may be hard decisions that you have to make, but the way we kind of group these is that ideally speaking, maybe there's a month where you really have to tell your friends, I'm sorry, I, I can't go out uh, and hang out with you guys, um, or maybe can we do something that is very low or no cost, rather than I can't go to the grocery store because there's not enough uh, in the bank account. Um, and just understanding that even if there are times where that is true, you know, that's no judgment on anybody. But hopefully, if we plan these things right and true to you in a time where maybe things are flowing a little better, or maybe there are, you know, a couple more gigs, that we can set yourself up in a way so that if the second part happens, it won't be a crisis. And that's where budgeting can really help in, in that uh, space. Because to be honest, if you don't budget at all, you, I, Connor, Emily, every other human on the planet, we are very bad at conceptualizing large numbers. If I ask you what 10 people in a room looks like, you could probably tell me. If I ask you what 100, you'd probably be wrong. If I ask you what 1,000 people in a room looks like, almost guaranteed you would not be able to accurately do it. The same thing is true with money. If we see even a couple hundred dollars in a bank account, it is very difficult to mentally account for where that goes. Okay, well, you know, I've got 500 for my part of the rent and that, you know, then there's this much for kind of going out. Oh, I got another expense. It becomes unmanageable because we have to live our lives. And inevitably, if there's a large number in that bank account, that money will fall through your fingers if you don't find a way to, um, well, account for it, I suppose, is the word. Um, yes, so that's all I kind of wanted to mention on that. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily now to uh, talk a bit about what 
you can do when money is really tight, as Adam said, when you can't fill those buckets? Are there other things um, that you can do? Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna look at some like really worst case scenarios because um, I found that a lot of the the budget advice you get even when it's like oh here's ways to be frugal and everything there have certainly been times in my life when I look at those and think these people have way more money than I do and they're assuming that I'm out buying a coffee every day and I can cut that out and I'll have all this extra money and I it's a luxury I cannot afford. Um, so what do we do when you can't even fill up that first bucket of your non-discretionary funds? Because uh, as people living in Toronto and as artists, that is a very real thing. Um, our minimum wage is around $15, but to live in Toronto, you need to make, I think the most recent Toronto living wage was like $22.60. And honestly, that's kind of low uh, because you could probably live off that if you had an apartment you've been in a long time but rent's going up. Our rent just went up by $400 a month. You know, most of us don't have that kind of wiggle room. Um, so what do you do? Um, I'm gonna go through some do's and I am very aware that all of this is easier said than done. So keep in mind that just because you hear something and think I can't do that, it doesn't, it's, that's not, a, it's not saying anything bad about you. Um, you know, I've had times where I've had to live off of $10 a week to feed myself and my boyfriend. Um, I've been days away from eviction. I've been on ODSP. So I say all of this with zero judgment because um, I've been there. So the, the first obvious one is you want to try to maximize your income. Um, of course, we all do. Uh, the arts are not generally the best paying. Um, but there's jobs you can sometimes pick up to make a bit of extra money in ways that uh, can fill in those gaps. So things like dog walking or uh, babysitting or housekeeping, those are all things that can work really well if you're an artist because they tend to be flexible on your own schedule and a lot of them are paid in cash. I am not suggesting that you should take work under the table um, because you should be paying taxes on all of the money you were paid, but there are some uh, practical benefits when money is really tight to being able to have that cash right then. And then when it comes time to tax season, figure out the rest of that. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, you want to try to limit your spending, of course. You can do that with anything from um, shopping sales. Um, I've gotten into the habit for a long time of I don't buy anything that's not on sale. Um, and, it, and it doesn't mean you have to get bad stuff either. It's just trying to plan out ahead of time what sort of things you want and need so you can you have some flexibility in when you spend. It's like the example that Adam had earlier about the computer, right? Um, sometimes we're stuck and you just need something right away. But a lot of the time I have kind of a list in my head of like, okay, well, I know sometime this year I'm going to need to update my computer or I know sometime in the next three months, my shoes are falling apart, I'm gonna need some. And if you can kind of keep track of things like that, then when something pops up, uh, you can save some money that way. Also knowing what time, uh, time of year has sales for different things, right? There's always back to school sales. Uh, you'll see like um, furniture, a lot of stuff that's aimed at like students. So things for like keeping things organized, computer stuff, end of the summer, and then, of course, uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday, all those sort of things. So trying to plan um, some of your spending around that can be really helpful. Uh, you want to try to pay down high interest loans as fast as possible. So uh, a lot of us probably have student loans. Um, they should be the last things you're paying. Even when it feels like ODSP is quite high, uh, really, as far as loans go, it's, they're so minor and they don't even count against you in a lot of things. So if you're trying to get like a mortgage or a car payment or something um, because they are government loans that are very low interest. So do pay them off as you can. If you have any other loans, deal with those first. Uh, credit cards can get expensive very, very quickly. So if you have 
uh, if you're making even just your minimum payments, the interest is building up really fast. And as it's adding more money that you're committed to paying, it's also destroying your credit score. I'm not going to get into how I feel about credit scores and whether those should exist or not. But the fact is, if you have a poor one, it's going to be harder to get loans at a good interest rate. So it makes it even harder to get out of this cycle. So if you've got um, credit card payments that are piling up, or if you've um, you know, leased something, um, you have a phone bill that hasn't been paid, don't just ignore it. It can feel really overwhelming because they can add up very quickly, but ultimately the people who have loaned you that money, they wanna get back whatever money they can. And if you eventually get to a point where you have to declare bankruptcy, they're not getting anything from you. Um, also, eventually you will talk to a human being on the other side who can be understanding. Um, but either way, if you've got something like that building up, call them. If you have a credit card and you haven't been able to make payments for two months, don't just ignore it and try to not stress about it. Phone them, explain your situation. They will work something out with you. It usually involves you paying, um, having some kind of uh, payment structure uh, that doesn't add up as quickly. Um, and it can help you not destroy your credit. If you find you can't even do that, uh, something that helped me a lot when I was at my absolute lowest financial point was um, there are sometimes credit cards that have promotions where you can do something like a, uh, a balance transfer. So what saved me a lot of money was I had a credit card that was maxed out because I had lost my job and uh, I had to put all of my living expenses on a, a card and missing one payment meant that it suddenly shot right up. But there was a, a new credit card out. I had a, still a decent credit score because prior to this point, I'd been paying everything fine. And I was able to transfer all of that money that was owed to this other card that because of a promotion, held that without any additional interest for a year. And that was a lifesaver, <laughs> like huge, huge help. Um, so you can also, like I happen to see that pop up, but you can call different credit cards and banks and, and explain your situation. And there are people who can help you find those sorts of things. You also wanna look to uh, cancel any unnecessary subscriptions. Um, I think a lot of us have a lot of them now. You know, it started with Netflix that was five bucks a month and then 10 bucks a month. And, and you get these different ones and there's always promo things. And then stuff that's like, oh, it's only this much for a certain amount of time. And then it jumps way up. Um, when it's a really small uh, charge, if you're not someone who reads through your credit card statement clearly every month, it can be easy to not notice them until suddenly you're like, oh, it's a hundred dollars more on my card than I expected this month. So make sure you keep on top of those things. I always put in my calendar, like this is the date that it's going to go up to the full price. And then a week before, put a thing that says cancel this subscription. I also find that a lot of the time, if you go and start to cancel something and then leave the website, they will send you something being like, don't leave and you'll get a discount. So there's another way to save some money sometimes. Um, things you want to avoid doing payday loan or cash for money places. They are worse than credit cards. Uh, there was a new law passed that has now limited the interest rate that they can have, but it's still much higher than anything else. It's at 30 something now. Um, like a credit card interest rate, you're probably looking at around 21%, which is still very high. But uh, the cash money ones, they're, they're really exploitive because they, uh, you see they're always in, in poor neighborhoods. They have a big sign that says something like $300 for $20, um, which can be misleading um, because of course it means, well, you owe them the $300 plus it's the $20 fee. And uh, they can be another thing that you get into a really vicious cycle of. Um, so I- Can I make a small note on that, Emily? Yeah. On the note of payday loan places, I should say, I personally have a deep, deep, let's say, I don't like them. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, not only do they charge incredibly high interest rates, I've seen people with payday loans where the rates are in the plus 40s, 40, 45%. 
but they also often have additional fees that they charge, which are in effect adding more, but a, a way to get around the legal interest rate. To be honest, all credit card companies, all loans, as we talked about in the bank, they are trying to make money off you. They are running a business. But to this level, they are trying to get you in a debt spiral for which you never pay back the loan and all you do is pay interest for the rest of your life. I will say that again. What they want you to do is to be stuck paying this loan of $500 to the point where you end up paying $5,000 by the time it's finally done. That is their whole business model. They will put themselves out there as being, you know, easy places. And I should say, by the way, also to a certain degree, pawn shops. I did not realize this for the majority of my life. I thought, how do pawn shops make money? Well, they take people's stuff and they sell it for money. They don't. They make money, and I know this because a friend of mine used to work in a pawn shop, he told me, by putting it on uh, payment kind of plans. And you use your stuff as collateral, but they're not going to make that much money from the stuff. They want to make it through the interest payments that you're paying to keep that for that motorcycle or for that you know, set of golf clubs or that computer or, or guitar that you put uh, in the pawn shop. So know that if you have to use them, again, no judgments, I get it. Like there are times where the paycheck does not come until Thursday and you gotta feed your kids on Tuesday. But know that these places are there as a whirlpool that they hope you, they hope and they are banking on the fact that you never get out from under it. So I would say that it should be an absolute last possible resort. Even swallowing pride and going to a family member that you know would lend you the money, but you're gonna feel like a, a failure for doing it. You are not, right? But to think about in the grand scheme of things, some of those small $20 for 300, by the time you're done with it, you could have been you know, paying 10 times as much because of how that interest compounds upon itself. Um, so sorry, that's me getting on my soapbox about uh, payday loan and cash for money places. No, I agree. I honestly think they should be illegal and I get really angry at them. And if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to stand up in front of one and stop everyone from going and be like, Here, no, 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 don't get involved. Um, yeah, they're, they're awful. Um, I should mention, by the way, they were illegal for many years and then became re-legal in the last 20 or 30 years, depending on the states in Canada, due to a lot of dysregulation, to be completely honest. So try and stay out of those. <laughs> um, and uh, again, don't ignore calls for payment from collections and things. Um, I've known so many people that start off with bad debt, but then they either they thought it would go away or they were just too anxious about it or any mix of things. They ignore it and it gets worse and worse and worse. And it can really mess stuff up for you for a very, very long time. Um, like I said, uh, a credit score, it's funny, a credit score is not really based on um, you necessarily having great uh, spending habits because you, ha you have to spend money. Um, like if, if you just, you know, went through school never having any debt and didn't need credit cards or you paid everything up, you wouldn't necessarily have a great credit score or might not have one at all. Um, you have to be able to show that you can take on debt and pay it off. And uh, a quick Google search will tell you what you can do to build up your credit score rather slowly over time. It's much easier to destroy it. Um, mine went from like 750 down to 600 in like a single month when I suddenly lost stuff. And I've only like this past year got back up to seven and never really above that. Um, you know, and that was after having basically in total two months of my uh, life where I was really, really behind on things. Um, but it, it makes it harder for you to get better credit card deals um, to get better any kind of loans. Um, so a few other just sort of like, from my personal experience, things that I have found help when money is really tight. Um, credit card points can be great. Uh, the optimum points that you can get at like shoppers and Loblaws I think those add up better than any other credit card points system I've seen. And I've had that as my only savings account for a very long time, because, you know, if I have no money one month, I still have enough right now. We've got enough to pay 
for groceries for two months, just from those. Um, there's different ones that will collect for different things too, you know, it's Scotia for going to see movies and stuff, but the ones that you can trade in either for cash back or can use at places that have necessities are especially good. Um, when you're looking at getting a credit card, uh, personally, I, I am opposed to any that have a, um, a yearly fee, so I will never take one of those, but there are some where that can be a benefit. Um, sometimes you pay a certain amount and then there's a better cash back thing. So if you're putting a lot on a credit card, that can be worthwhile. Or if you know that you're often not going to be able to pay your balance in full, there are ones that have a, a yearly fee, um, but then the interest rate is lower. So definitely do your research with that. There's a lot of different ones. Figure out what works best for you. And again, if you get behind on something, call them. Um, and then also <laughs> selling some of your stuff. And I don't mean selling off like your prized possessions or all your clothes or anything like that. Um, but uh, a lot of the time we end up with something, maybe you have like a formal dress or something that you know you had for a wedding that you never used again. Um, there's lots of consignment shops and vintage shops in the city. I have so many books and movies. I've taken a bunch of those to BMV. Um, you, you have to you know balance don't don't sell things where it's going to really like hurt your soul to get rid of them because the chance of you getting money that makes up for that is probably slim but uh every once in a while we do a sort of Marie Kondo type thing and go through and be like I haven't used this in three months probably not going to use it again and sometimes you really just need to make that extra like hundred dollars that month and those type of things um can help you do that uh, we can go to the next slide, please, Connor. So again, just to drive home that there is no judgment here. Uh, having debt does not mean failure in any way, period, end of sentence. Um, there is some debt that's good. It is good to, at some point in your life, have debt. In an ideal world, you have debt that you can pay off regularly um, that isn't like dragging you down. Um, something like a mortgage, you know, you're paying into it and, and equity um, or even for a car. Um, but no matter what kind of debt you have, uh, don't see it as a personal failure. It is so expensive to live right now uh, for anybody and for artists, especially. We'll go into this in a moment. Um, we tend to have really precarious uh, employment and it's very difficult to budget and it's very difficult to make ends meet. Um, I've said this a few times, but again, there are always way out of debt. You need to talk to the debt holders. Um, you can also, there are places that will specifically consolidate your loans. Um, so if you have debt with a whole bunch of different places and it feels really overwhelming, go to one of those. Um, bankruptcy can be an answer. It is definitely not a magic fix um, and it will affect your ability to access loans uh, for a point. I'm not a financial expert, so I'm not gonna go into that, but. Um, it's another one to not think of as my life is over if this happens. It's just a, um, it, it's something that if you feel like you are incapable of pulling yourself out of multiple debts, it is worth going and talking to somebody because that might be something that can help. Um, it can be really expensive being poor. There's that example, was it John Locke or something about how um, poor people end up spending more money because you have to buy the the crappy boots, whereas someone who has, uh, and so you have to replace them all the time. But someone that's has from Catch Twenty Two. The Catch Twenty Two. The, there you yeah, go. The, so, the you book know, by Joseph Heller. There, that's true. That's the same thing. Um, but yeah, right. It can be. It can be really expensive being poor because um, you have to do short-term fixes a lot of the time. That often means buying stuff that is not as good quality, or um, maybe not having the money to repair things. Um, and it's not really a way around that except to, again, try your best to look as long term as you can with things and, um, and try and get things on sale, try and get things secondhand, try and spread out your spending to follow, um, you know, sales and things uh, to do your best to go for the best quality, whatever you can get, because that often will save you money in the long term. And it's okay to ask for help. 
I saw just yesterday a headline that said nine in 10 adults are getting financial help from their parents. It, it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of unheard of. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's frustrating, I think, for um, us millennials especially because we were raised being told by uh, a bunch of baby boomers, you know, go to school and, and be good and get a good job and you're gonna be able to have all these things. And we did that and we have debt and we can't live anywhere near as well as your parents or your grandparents did. Um, it's an unfortunate fact of life. And it means that we cannot compare ourselves in where we are financially to where our parents were at this time, if they grew up in Canada as well. And uh, so don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's from friends and family or there are different community resources. Uh, there's some government ones. I'll go over a few of those in a bit, but. I would also say, I, I just wanna make a point here. A lot, I think it's easy for a lot of people to look at those who are much well-to-do, wealthy, rich, and everything in our society and the whole way that capitalism and especially, you know, North American kind of mentality of personal responsibility and things like that tells, has been telling us and hammering us, hammering into us since the day we were born, uh, that everything that happens to you, both good and bad, is a result of your own actions. Let's just use budgeting as an example. I have, you know, sat down on worked with financial plans for people who are making, you know, effectively nothing, and people who make well over half a million dollars a year. And I will tell you that when it comes to people that understand where their money's going, who do the work, who actually do not need to be coached on budgeting for me, it is not the people making half a million dollars a year. People, and largely, a lot of times when you see that kind of wealth and where it comes from, I don't wanna to get too down this rabbit hole, it can come from a bunch of places. And a lot of time, it is luck. Somebody opened a business at the right place in the right time, and it happened to do well. And yes, they, I guarantee you, they worked very hard at it, but there's that element there. Or they got an inheritance. Or at the same time, from the flip side, Somebody was doing very well for themselves and they got an illness and became disabled and could no longer, you know, bring in money and therefore their circumstances changed. Only you know your story and try not to, as difficult as I know this is, compare yourself to somebody who seems to be doing much better than you and say, well, they must know something I don't, or Adam, you know, must know something that I don't know, right? We're, we're hoping that you can take some of these concepts and, and you know, use them for yourself. Um, but ultimately speaking, you know, like Emily was saying here, you know, none of anything that might happen is not your fault. And at the same time, don't assume that those are doing well is because they made the right choices. Because a lot of times that is not the case. And I'll tell you that from a professional opinion of seeing many different people and many different, like basically my job is to like pop the hood of everybody's car and check to see what the engine's looking like. I've seen a lot of engines, right? And so that's just the two cents that I wanted to say on that, that slide before we go for, further. Yeah, I think it's going to get passed on to you here anyway for financial advisors and other yes. professionals. And then I'll, I'll talk about some specific artist challenges. All right. So I think we can flip to the next slide there. Um, so when it comes to a professional uh, of any kind, regardless of what they do, I'm a firm believer that you must do, you must have two things in there. One, you must see that they bring value because all professionals will charge money of some kind. Right? This is a professional relationship that you have with somebody. So you must find some form of value in that. Now, what is that value? I mean, it could be somebody literally like, you know, they help you make more money than you, than you pay them for. Fair enough. It could be they take a mental load off your plate that you don't have to worry about and it frees you up to do other things. That's a form of value. Uh, it could be that they are a family member and you are, you know, helping them with their income and in the same way they're kind of, you know, giving back to you. Whatever it is, it's, it's up to you. And then the second thing, and just as important, is that you have a trust in them and a strong relationship. 
Because at the end of the day, like we said, you are paying this person for a service that may be in your best interest, but there is also, there is kind of a conflict of interest of some kind in there. They have a vested interest to do something to make money from you, right? So keep that in mind. When, so when we talk about different kind of financial professionals in particular, um, the four kind of big ones that we want to focus on are on the screen right here. So there's um, an accountant, in particular what's called a charter professional accountant or CPA, but there are actually many different types of accountants. You know, these are people that help you with your taxes. So they help you in particular with, uh, they might provide tax advice, they may not, uh, but often, you know, they will provide tax filing services. Um, or they will provide some other kind of thing, usually around the payment of taxes. They could be personal accountants that help you only with your personal situation. If you are a business professional and you have a business entity like a corporation, they can help you with that. Um, you know, it's a wide kind of uh, sea of not all accountants are the same, just like not all of the rest of the people on this slide are the same. So one of the things to think about is, again, do you find value in that? If you have a relatively simple tax situation, you may want to go to an accountant uh, and just have them file, you know, your T4, your T4As, and maybe some of your medical expenses. Okay, that may be worth the price that you pay for that. It's probably going to cost you a couple hundred dollars for somebody who's worthwhile. There may also be more discount either um, accounting clinics. Perhaps there are also people who are, you know, uh, in school and are, you know, trained to do so, but maybe starting out their practice that might be more favorable. There may also be low cost or even free services, programs, softwares that you can use. The one thing about that and why I do always recommend professionals is that if you are using, say, an accounting software that's free, a lot of them are very good at saying, okay, what's on this box of your T4A? But you never know what you don't know. So just be aware that you may be making mistakes uh, in there that you would never know because it's a computer program. And I mean, I've used ChatGPT, but it's not yet that good to kind of know you and know your life. That's where the trust comes in, the relationship. The professional should know you well enough that you say something and they say, oh, Adam, what about that other thing that you told me about? We should explore that. Financial advisor. So this is in quotes because uh, up until about this year, actually, believe it or not, it was not really a, a, a government regulated term. And there's a lot of people that could call themselves financial advisors who did a variety of different works. One of the things that I would say, like the CPA, which is a professional designation that has a governing body and a strict rubric of what it means to be a CPA. You see someone that says CPA, you know that they must have had this training, they have to do this amount of professional development every year, they have to keep a license in the province they're in. Look for your financial advisor to have something similar. A big one is looking at the CFP and QAFP, which means Certified Financial Planner, and qualified associate financial planner specifically. Effectively, you know, qualified financial planner is sort of like the little brother to the certified financial planner. But the CFP in particular is a worldwide designation that basically tells you that this person knows what they're talking about when it comes to financial planning. They have taken, uh, typically it takes about uh, three years of minimum industry experience. Uh, they have to go through quite a few, uh, you know, courses, I'd say, Ooh, uh, probably about 200 odd hours of coursework. They have to pass an exam. They have to also keep their license in good standing, meaning they have a, a rubric of ethics and they have a rubric of, uh, of other things that they must keep um, and a variety of other things. But to basically kind of show you in a shorthand, if you see that behind someone's name, you can generally expect that they are trust trusted. That being said, it's important to know, you know, what services does this financial advisor provide? Are they giving purely investment advice only? Are they giving full comprehensive financial planning? Do they give uh, insurance planning? Is that something they do or they do not do? Do they give retirement planning? Do they give all this other type of stuff, estate planning? There's a million different things that they can do. To determine, is this a professional that is best for my situation and my needs? Important note about financial advisors and financial professionals, be very, very, very skeptical in the ages of uh, social media and especially TikTok that there are 
for every CFP out there, there are probably a thousand different gurus who are really just, I don't know if they believe their own uh, narrative, but you know, it, a lot at the best, you know, it's dubious financial advice, and at the worst, it's outright scams. So a few things that you want to uh, think about, you know, to trigger kind of your immediate skepticism is if you see things like get rich quick, although people don't tend to use that phrase that much anymore because obviously people know it's a bad one. Build generational wealth is basically get rich quick for 2023. Doesn't necessarily mean this person's not saying something correct. It's a, uh, listen, I'll say it's a very sexy marketing thing, build generational wealth, who wouldn't want that? But to think, well, how are they doing it? If you see any form of uh, expected investment return where they say things like double your money in X days, or to be honest, anything past a double digit return, like saying you can get 10% you know, per month, those are unrealistic numbers. It is not that it's not possible, but it is probably not possible in a repeatable way. I will say that there is one pretty well-known way to build money very quickly, and it's by selling courses to people online, telling them how to get rich. So if you see anybody that's selling a course, first and foremost, you'd assume they're scamming you until proven otherwise. So keep that in mind. Um, there's also a lot, a lot, a lot of scams around cryptocurrencies, uh, previously NFTs, although it's starting to fall by the wayside. These kind of things, because they're new and they're exciting and they're sexy. And when the, new, when the next new sighting and sexy kind of thing comes along, you best believe that all the grifters from there will move over to the next thing. They did it when the internet came around and anybody that had a website, you could convince somebody to invest. They did it back in the 17th century, believe it or not, selling tulip bulbs. Yes, like the flower. You know, it's a, if you ever want to find a nice little Wikipedia rabbit hole, just Google tulip craze and read about what happened in there. Some of these tulip bulbs were selling for tens of thousands of today's dollars back in the 17th century. And ultimately, they were just different colored plants. So that's the kind of financial advisor. And I'd say, you know, so like the CPA, look for the designation. Do the sniff test. If it feels too good to be true, it probably is. Um, you know, take kind of a really skeptical view of everybody, I'd say, um, but especially of folks in, to be honest, my line of work. Uh, brokers we put in here. So specifically, we're talking about kind of mortgage and lending brokers here. These are people that help you find loans. So a lot of times it is mortgages for houses and that, uh, but it could be other things like accessing equity in a home you already have, uh, lines of credit, that sort of thing. Uh, typically speaking, they will be kind of a middleman between lending institutions. So you could go directly to, you know, ABC Bank and say, hey, I want to take out a mortgage. They are only going to give you their stuff. Or you could go to a broker and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Can you shop around with all your contacts and see what the best deal I can get is? Type of thing. Um, oh, just to go back a second to financial advisor, also be aware that certain financial advisors, uh, you know, have, they have different ways of getting paid. The two biggest ways are what's called the assets under management model, which is you pay a certain percentage of what you invest with them to them as a fee. So, you know, if it's 2% and you have $1,000, that would be 20 bucks. If you have a million dollars, that would be $20,000. So kind of also determine is the fees you're paying worth the service that you're getting. The second one is a straight, basically, you know, fee for fee only model where you say, okay, I want to engage you to make me a full financial plan. They'll say, okay, that's going to cost you a thousand dollars. You're going to pay half now, kind of half when you get it. That may not be everybody's model, but that's just one kind of way of doing it, but it's a flat rate. After you pay for that, you're probably paying for the service rather than the relationship, and then your relationship may end until the next time you want to engage them and pay them again. And then the final one is lawyers. So like the rest of all of these guys, lawyers can be any number of things. They can be divorce lawyers, they can be real estate lawyers, they can be estate lawyers, they can be uh, corporate lawyers, they can be a million different things. But the idea here is lawyers are the folks that we hire to know the law. And Unfortunately, we live in a society where the laws are the rules that we've decided we all must uh, kind of go by. So it's important that we follow them, as they say. I shouldn't say unfortunately. That's kind of a joke there. So do you need a lawyer, for instance, to do things like draft a will, 
to uh, close on a property that you're buying, to uh, you know, form a business? Sometimes the answer is yes, you legally have to. And there's no real way you can get around it. Sometimes the answer is technically no, but you should. Same kind of idea as the accountant. You can draft your own will, but you don't know what you don't know. So it may be worth talking to a legal professional. Same kind of idea, what do they charge? Most of the times lawyers will work on a uh, billable hours service, kind of like the fee model that the financial planner might work under, where they will give you a scope of their business. There may be a minimum amount of hours that you have to purchase uh, or a minimum kind of threshold you have to hit. And then after that, it may be X dollars per hour. And I should say, by the way, that's generally speaking how accountants are paid as well. Brokers will typically take a percentage commission of the uh, final product that they, they sell you. That may be paid by you, it may be paid by their brokerage um, in some way. So those are kind of the big four there of financial uh, advisors. Um, there's the accountants, they're the people that help you file your taxes, they may also have tax advice. There's the financial advisors, that can be anywhere from a planner to an investment advisor and kind of everything in between. Uh, there's a broker uh, who's somebody that helps you, uh, you know, find generally loans. You could also say insurance brokers. They would help you find insurance. Same idea. And there's lawyers. They're the people that help you navigate the law and make sure that everything that you're doing in your life is legal and compliant. So, yeah, I think that's a good summary of all of those or all of us folks, I should say. Yeah, and I'll add, I'll add one more thing and then uh, we'll move on because I realize we're also running out of time here. Um, but uh, Adam mentioned the SNF test and, and this is coming from somebody, I'm going to be a lawyer in June and, and Adam is a, a, um, a licensed professional as well. And the thing to be aware of is that all these people um, are, their, their job is to provide advice. And that's what you come to them for. That is the, they are experts in something. Generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, when somebody uh, offers you, like just says without getting to know you and your specific situation, if they try to offer you the advice, the way to do something, that is usually a red flag. Now, of course, sometimes there's simple situations, but when you are somebody who's certified, usually you have insurance backing you and you're allowed to provide advice to people because you back that advice. But uh, the old joke with lawyers especially is that the first answer that any lawyer is gonna give you is it depends because everybody needs a full scope of what a situation is before they can actually give you advice. So, um, Anybody who just offers advice without any additional qualifications is usually trying to sell you something, unfortunately, mm -hmm. rather than trying to uh, to actually help you in your situation. Just a, a little uh, a thing to keep aware of. The other thing that uh, Adam alluded to, this is definitely true of lawyers. Um, oftentimes you can get 30 minute consultations. There's also clinics, as Adam said, um, where, uh, you're welcome, like, if you feel like maybe you need help, there are usually resources that are legitimate resources. Um, mm -hmm. And again, schools are a great place to look for those um, things that call themselves clinics, like legal clinics uh, or uh, financial aid clinic, um, community clinics that are nonprofits that are registered that have some something behind them. Those are the places to look because um, we in society, there, there are solutions for the people who can't afford $300 an hour for a lawyer or something like that. And, and these services are for everyone. And I think that's an important thing that I think when I didn't have any money, I definitely grew up thinking like, well, lawyers aren't for me. Like as a kid, like we don't have lawyers because we don't have a, an accountant because we don't have enough money to have those things, but they mm -hmm. do exist for everyone. And there's a way to engage them for your particular situation. And uh, an, an important thing, they will also advise you about whether they are correct. For, they, they are not, they're specifically not supposed to take your money and be engaged by you if they can't actually provide the value that they're saying that they can provide. 
they are supposed to advise you not to hire them if you're, it's not the right um, solution. And I'll leave it at that for financial advisors. So Emily, I think, is going to go through a few specific challenges for artists. Okay, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but there is a handout um, that is in the, the link that is going to be in the YouTube um, description. It's also on our website where you can get a copy of this presentation as a PDF and a thing that has a bunch of links. So you can follow those links and they'll give you some more information. So on top of all of the problems we've already gone over, as artists, there are some additional ones we tend to face. Um, we tend to work contracts and those can be um, very low paying, sometimes, sometimes even the union ones, uh, they can be unpredictable. Um, they, it, it means having um, often precarious employment um, even if you're somebody who's getting some regular contracts as like an, an actor or something, I've known people who go for a long stretch and don't have anything and then they get a few offers and they can only take the one because of some of the overlap. So uh, it's, <laughs> it's a difficult thing to plan for. Um, so some general challenges we tend to face is the unpredictable income, having short term employment. This can have a, a, a few issues um, for one. Uh, we're often independent contractors, um, and basically that means we, we don't have the, um, the same rights as employees. It can be a whole webinar and its own thing, but um, often the contracts you're, you're brought on for, for a short period of time, you are not considered an employee. And so while you're not paying into like certain taxes and things, you, don't, you also don't have um, access to something like EI, employment insurance. Uh, even if you are an employee, to get EI, you have to work a certain number of hours. And um, I find in the arts, a lot of time, we don't quite make those amounts. We get some under the table pay, which I mentioned before, um, can sometimes be beneficial short term, but really trying to track that, trying to budget for it, and then making sure that you are um, properly accounting for it and your taxes can be complicated and can sometimes mean, even though we're not making a lot of money overall, because we have complicated stuff to go through come tax season, we're going and looking for a, an accountant or somebody to help with that. And it ends up costing um, quite a bit more money than we're really capable of, of paying. Uh, and there can be a lot of lack of uh, unemployment supports. Um, and, and not to mention the fact that I'm sure all of you artists have heard at some point if you bemoan the fact that this is a, a difficult industry to be in, someone has said, well, you chose that and you know, you should, you should be happy, you're following your dream. Um, it, people tend to undervalue the arts in North America, unfortunately. So you don't always get a lot of sympathy either. And that is all very frustrating. We'll go to the next slide. There are though some unemployment supports. So I'm gonna go over quickly some just general ones and then a few that are specifically for artists. So it's really difficult to be unemployed or uh, often more difficult to be underemployed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're living in a city like Toronto, making minimum wage, you probably cannot live, you certainly can't live on your own. It, at this point, it can be difficult even living with roommates. Um, but there are things you should be aware of to make sure that you were getting all of the government supports that are out there. So employment insurance, if you have been employed as an employee um, and then you lose your job, you may be eligible for EI. There's also something called sickness EI, which is if you go uh, have to stop working because of some kind of sickness. This includes mental health. So if you um, have depression, for example, and your mental health gets really bad and you can't work for a month and you're working as an employee, even if your employer doesn't have something set up, to cover um, like sick days or any of that sort of stuff, you can apply for sickness EI. Again, I have links to these things. You can look on the websites, they explain it more. Uh, it's not a ton of money. It takes a couple of weeks for it to start. Um, it certainly is not ideal, but it's better than nothing. There is also the Ontario Disability Support Program or ODSP. Uh, it's, it has a lot of faults. <laughs> it's difficult to get onto. 
uh, you have to prove that you are uh, disabled and uh, is a, um, a lengthy and stressful process. And then even if you do get it, it's not really enough money to live off of. But if you are disabled and you cannot work regularly or can't work at all because of that, absolutely go for it. Um, also applying and being accepted for that means that then there are some other supports that you can automatically qualify for, uh, especially if you're going to like a post-secondary thing. Um, a lot of universities have different funds and things for disabled students. And if you already say, oh yeah, look, I'm on ODSP, you don't have to go through the same process with that. Um, there's also Ontario Works or OW, which is basically welfare, um, considerably less money than even ODSP is. Uh, but you just have to prove that you don't have the money to live. Um, it's something that gets such a bad rap. And uh, because of a couple very high profile cases from like 20 years ago, there are people that seem to really believe everybody who is on uh, OW is lazy and entitled and they're on it because they just want to, you know, get money for free and not do anything. And it's, it's a ridiculous and completely incorrect assumption because no one is living well on OW. There's, there's no way you get so little money. Um, but if you find that an emergency has come up, you've lost your job, especially if rent is coming due and you don't have the money for it. The only really good thing I can say about Ontario Works is it is processed very quickly. So if you lose your job, and you go, oh my God, I now don't have this next check to pay my rent in two weeks, go to an OW office. There's a very good chance you will get um, approved for at least that month and you'll have some money to put towards that. Um, set aside your pride. Don't think of it as a shameful thing. It's not, it shouldn't be. Um, and there's a lot more to it that really is more helpful than the very meager sum they give you. There are different employment supports uh, one that is particularly interesting, really to artists, is called investing in neighborhoods. And it's something that partners with um, nonprofits and charities in the city. So some of them are things for like therapy and medical things, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, theaters. And basically what it is, is the government is paying part of the salary and the company is paying part. So the company can hire somebody um, for less money, which is good for them because they're a nonprofit and they hire people who specifically um, are low income. They're, they tend to be jobs that will give you some kind of um, training or good job experience. And they make sure that you get enough hours. It's a, a one-year contract generally, but um, they make sure you get enough hours that you do qualify for EI. So if you don't get another job right after that, you've still got a bit of a, a cushion there. That's a great program. They have some other um, employment things too. If you, if you don't have um, a lot of skills or relevant skills, if you don't have um, like any post-secondary training, there's lots of different subsidized things, especially stuff for the trades. Um, but there's, there's all different options there. And generally the people that are working in the employment supports part are very helpful and very understanding. And you can go in there with anything from like, hey, I've been working in this industry for 10 years and now there's no work and I don't know what to do and they'll help you. Or you can go and be like, I didn't finish high school. I um, don't have any particular uh, specific skills. I don't have a resume and they can help with that. So it, it really is for anybody who needs financial support. You can go to the next slide. And then there's stuff that is specific for artists. So there are grants, of course. Um, the main spots you'll find, those are the TAC, Toronto, um, why did I just blank on what this? Arts, Arts Council. Toronto Arts Council. We, did, we just submitted our grant the other day, so I was yeah. trying on my mind. <laughs> yeah, uh, the OAC, the Ontario Arts Council, and the CAC, um, the Canadian Arts Council. So Canadian Council for the Arts. Technology. Canadian Council for, sorry, yes, because BC. it's in French and, and English. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the, the main spots that you will find. Uh, grants on the handout. I broke them down a lot more. Um, personally, I know mostly about the, uh, the theater grants because that's what I work in, but I know there are things for um, 
visual arts, dance, music, um, media. And then there's also ones um, for specific groups of people. There's a lot of different stuff for um, indigenous creators. There's some new ones for um, black artists. And sometimes those are also specific to a medium like indigenous artists working in dance. And sometimes it's just a general, anything you wanna do, you're an indigenous artist, here's a fund. Um, they also have uh, things like recommender grants, uh, which you'll see come out where uh, some larger nonprofits um, kind of facilitate that. And so that's great for really small uh, theater companies or individuals. And then there are uh, research and development grants. Um, this again is a thing that could have an entire webinar. It, it does take time um, and a, a certain kind of skill to, to get a grant. And with a lot of things, you need to start with the, the smaller ones. Like it, you don't generally get something from the Ontario or Canada Council for like a project grant until you get one from the Toronto Arts Council, but there are specialty ones. Bygone's first grant we ever got was um, a Canadian Arts Council one. Uh, that was a digital now thing that was specifically something that came out of COVID to have artists figuring out how to have live performance um, with the, uh, delivered digitally. So there's ones like that that come up. Um, when you're in school, there are scholarships and bursaries. There are tons of those for uh, universities and colleges. There's fewer for the, um, the schools that do like certificate programs and things, but they do exist. Uh, you can also sometimes get things through foundations. Um, most of those are, you have to be a, a charity, um, but that's another, another place to look. Uh, then there's things like business loans. Depends what you're doing. Um, because of course, the, like if you're trying to get a loan from a bank, um, they want to know that you're going to be able to pay it back. And if you just go in and say, I am an actor and I think you should give me a loan to help my career, it's not likely to happen. But depending on what you're setting up, um, if you've got a, a business plan and you can show that you have a way moving forward to making money, it can happen. There's also programs like Futurepreneur that are set up and aimed specifically at um, uh, entrepreneurs and artists, and they're a bit more um, flexible with what sort of things they're looking for. Um, that program in particular involves you getting mentorship. So that can be something, something to look for. Um, and then also just reach out to the people and places you want to work with. Um, it, sometimes it's hard to get a hold of them, but generally when you do, people love hearing that you like what they do. And if you are looking to, um, you know, get into directing, say, and there is a, a theater director you really admire or a company you really admire, uh, reach out and let them know and put your name out there to be like, hey, I, I want to help with this. And there are, um, the arts community is really cliquey. And so it can be hard to get into things, stuff like directing often you don't see open calls for. So you have to kind of get your name out there but once you get known by a few people as like, oh, this is the person I can go to for whatever, um, it helps you start, people start calling you for work instead of you having to go after everybody. Um, and they also might know different supports that are out there. Um, so yeah, we have, to, we have to wrap it up. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But again, the handout I've got has a big long list of them. I encourage you to look at them. And uh, especially if you belong to um, a specific community, look up like grants for um, Asian Canadians or indigenous um, painters or whatever. There's a lot of really specific things out there that I don't necessarily know about because they, they aren't for me, um, but there's all different community groups and different government fundings and, and things. And uh, it can take a bit of work, but there is money out there to be found. Okay, so thank you for joining us. Um, this, this being our intro one, we went over a lot of things uh, sort of broadly, but we welcome people to email us with questions or put it in the comments. And uh, this is a new program for us. 
So any kind of feedback you have from, um, you know, the stuff that was talked about to uh, your slides are really great or, or too boring or anything like that, um, let us know. It's, a, it's something that we're trying to work on and grow and we want to hear from you. Gentlemen, if you've got anything to add? No, stay tuned for the, the other five. We're, we're posting them every two weeks until uh, June 15th. They're, the last two happen one week apart, but basically every two weeks this time uh, we have, and we, we're gonna go deep dive into almost everything we talked about today. Yeah, yeah, our next one is on Thursday, April 27th, and it's laying a foundation, skills and concepts for business and financial success for artists. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Adam, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, we'll see you all again. Take care.